Inhabit my praise, Lord. Inhabit my praise. Hallelujah. 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 We truly want the Lord to inhabit our praise. And when I think of the word inhabit, I think of the word live in. So as I'm saying hallelujah, Jesus is living in that praise. As I'm raising my hands, Jesus is in my hands being raised. As I'm worshiping God, the Holy Spirit is being magnified, amplified, echoed through my praise. And then we're in the presence of the Lord. His shadow is covering everything. All the condemnation, all the past sins, all the unforgiveness, all the bitterness, all the gunk, all the mess, all the failures. He's covering those that grew up without fathers. He's covering broken relationships. He's covering it all in his shadow. Remain under his presence is the word I hear him saying to his people. Remain under his presence because under the shadow of the almighty that we are covered. Father, I thank you, Lord. First off, Lord, I thank you that you said you want to inhabit my praise. I thank you, oh God, that you want to have fellowship with us. Father, I thank you that you said as far as the east is from the west, so far have you separated our sins from us. Lord, I thank you that you keep no record of our wrongdoing, but you keep records of the grace that you're ready to pour out upon us. Lord, I thank you that you said you will give us a new heart, a new mind, a new spirit, a new body, and you will give us a song of worship. But Lord, I thank you most of all, as we worship you, you said that you sing over us. So Father, sing renewal over your people. Sing strength over your people. Sing worship over your people. Sing joy over your people. Sing blessings over your people. Sing restoration over your people. And Lord, as the chains fall off, as the doubt falls off, as the sickness falls off, as the disease falls off, as all of it falls off of our bodies, let us truly be a temple of worship that you can inhabit and be magnified and glorified and worshiped in. And Father, transform us into the kingdom of God so that as you take the throne of worship upon our hearts and we sing worship unto you, you can truly be magnified and amplified and the light will shine in us that those that are not saved will see your glory and be saved. Those that are sick will see your glory and be healed. Lord, we are asking you to magnify yourself in us. More of you and less of us, oh God, so that as you inhabit our praise, you are inhabit our spirit, you are inhabit our mind, you are inhabit our soul. You want to inhabit our body. You want to inhabit every inch of us, oh God, so that we will reflect that of the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. 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 I said the Lord is high above the heaven and his glory above the nations. I said the Lord is high above the heavens and his glory above the nations. Give God the highest praise, acknowledge him always, and all the people say, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, Halle, Hallelujah. Halle, halle, hallelujah. 
of days every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne and worship you will be exalted oh God and your kingdom shall not pass away oh ancient of days oh ancient of days compare to your matchless worth nothing in this in our in our meager little minds can compare to the glory in the presence of God hallelujah we bless you God we lift you up right now God we honor and extol you right now father hallelujah we bless you God we bless you Lord mm. we bless you hallelujah mm. how many of you are thankful to, just for waking up this very morning Hallelujah. Had it not been for his infinite glory, his endless grace, we would not have awakened to see the day. I don't care what you went through this week. I don't, I don't mean to sound insensitive, but I don't care what you went I don't care what I went through this week. All I know is that God is greater than every situation I face, everything I could possibly go through. He is greater. He is great and greatly to be praised. I don't care how I felt. Actually, I felt quite good this week and I bless him for that. But even when the times I don't feel good, even whether it's emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, I still bless God and give him every ounce of praise that my meager body can give. Hallelujah. Can we do that this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. We bless you, God. We bless you, God. The heavens are telling, telling the earth how great you are. And we are responding to your love the oceans are rising rising and falling at your word and we are responding to your love my god how great you are how great how great you are hallelujah how great you are my god how great you are you are how great you You are how 
how great you are how great you are how great you you are God how great you are God Hallelujah. Agnes Day Jimmy Agnes Day is here there's someone someone here we want to especially pray for she uh, runs a daycare in our community but she's been struck with what the doctor said was MS but we know God is a healer Hallelujah. And she says she wants to come today because she knows a place that has the power of God in it. So I'm going to ask Donna Martin, would you come, sweetheart? And guess who brought her? Mike Hartsock's parents are here today. Y'all remember our beloved Mike Hartsyke. He sends his love, by the way. So I want them to come. And I want our elders to come. In fact, if you are sick in your body, why don't you just come today? Stand, stand with us. We know Jehovah Rapha. We know the Lord who is the healer. You come today. Intercessors, I want you to surround Donna. Lay hands on her. Elders, we're glad to have Sister Tasha back in our midst today. We believe in God for a complete work. A complete work. Come elders. We're going to need some help. Come ministers. Intercessors. And just find an individual as the Lord lays. Lord leads you. Lay hands on that individual. And begin to pray. Father in the name of Jesus. I pray for Donna in Jesus Christ's name. Thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha. Thank you that you are the Lord who heals. 
You have a destiny for her. You have a purpose. You are not done with her yet. And so I decree and I speak into her life right now. I speak a physical miracle. I speak your healing anointing upon her in Jesus Christ's name. We give you glory in advance. And I believe now you're touching her body in Jesus Christ's name. Because she is your child. She is a kingdom citizen. She has rights. You love her. And we claim healing for her right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. MS die. MS die. In the name of Jesus. Let life come forth in her. In Jesus name. In Jesus name.
the Lord was speaking to me and he was telling me that if you want a healing of any kind start worshiping him if you were cold if you were cold you get warm by standing near a fire. It's the same with healing. If you have coldness in your spirit towards someone, about someone, stand close to the flame of Jesus. Give him worship and praise. That feeds the fire. That gets it hotter than hot. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for healing. We thank you, Lord, that you're able to heal even beyond our wildest imagination. Lord, you're able to heal, oh God, relationships, oh God, that person that you may have had the issue with has died you're able to heal that Lord you're able to heal anything because healing Lord goes beyond life and death healing goes beyond ages it goes beyond years and days and time it, it, it goes it has no limit because healing is in forgiveness and you are the author of forgiveness so father in the name of Jesus I speak oh God for those oh Lord that are under my voice that are desiring healing in their relationships father in the name of Jesus I command that enmity to die in Jesus name I command the enmity to die in the name of Jesus you're cursed like that fig tree and you will dry up from your roots in the name of Jesus Father, I speak healing, O oh God. I speak your word of healing, Lord. Lord, you said in your word, every word that proceeds out of your mouth will accomplish that which you said it about to do. It shall not return to you void. You said it, O oh God, is going to happen. You said by his stripes we were healed. It's going to happen. Period. You said they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It's going to happen. No matter what. No matter what. Hallelujah. 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 So Father we speak healing oh God. Healing in relationships. Healing down in the deep places in the heart the places oh God it, it seems like we're hiding from the others but Lord you know we need the healing right there so Father we open up to it Lord right now Lord we just open up every corner oh God that your healing can enter in and reign because healing is in your kingdom oh God and you are the king of the kingdom. So healing has to reign in Jesus' name. Father, we're speaking your healing reign right now on Tasha Young and her mother. We're speaking your healing reign, oh God, in Linda Downey's body, oh God. And in Ashton Sebro, we command the healing to reign in his body. We command the healing to reign in Stacy Lundford's mother's body in the name of Jesus. We command the healing to reign in Joe Walker's body in the name of Jesus. 
Father, we speak, Lord, your comfort, O oh Lord, your encouragement. Like a nice warm blanket on a cold day to surround the hearts and minds and families, oh God, of Sandy and Paul, oh Lord, where their mother's with you, oh God. Father, and also all of those, oh Lord, that may still be going through, oh God, about the death of their loved one. Father, we speak, Lord, your healing blanket to surround them, O oh God, to nuzzle them, O oh Lord, that, that they would feel you father them in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the healings that you're doing today, O oh God, physically. Thank you, Lord, the healing in Donna's body, O oh Lord, you're doing physically, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the healings that you're doing, O oh God, in Joyce's body, in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the healings you're doing, O oh God. We give you glory. We give you praise. We give you honor, Lord, because that's always been the result of healing. We think that it should happen after the healings occur. No! Lord, we praise you right now. We praise you right now. In the midst of it, oh God, we give you glory. We give you praise because our eyes are on you. Hallelujah. Oh, lover of our souls, we give you worship and praise and adoration in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, we can't wait, oh God, to see what you're going to do next, Lord. We can't wait to see what you're going to do next, oh God. Not only next in our lives, oh God, but next right here in fellowship, oh God. The word, oh Lord, the worship, oh God, everything, oh God. We just can't wait, oh God. Because we know, Lord, that you, oh God, are thrilling. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God your best and not what's left. If you think you're down, you'll go down. If you think you're up, you'll go up. Stop expecting your current job to fund your vision. When you bring your offering, have that expectation in your heart and in your mind that this current thing cannot fund my vision. It's bigger than that. Yes. Don't hold up, don't hold, hold on to his, history and expect your history to expense up in expense of your destiny. Yes. Never make a permanent decision about it. your your temporary situation in other words the way you are now is just temporary God is about to make a better situation permanent yeah. lastly you can't be who you are going to be who and still remain who you used to be let me read that again you can't be who you're going to be if you still want to hold on to what you used to be don't Give God your best and he'll do the rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this offering that we're about to bring God as we're going to bring it with an expectation. Knowing that our current situation will not finance our future. It's bigger than that, God. We have a bigger expectation that we're holding on to. Knowing that the seed that we're bringing is just a small mustard seed and that you'll bring big mountains, break big money, big jobs, God. And we're holding on to that by faith, God. Bless everyone that bring their offering today, God. Multiply, God. Bless the church, our pastors, and everyone that's gathered here on today. All these things we thank you for in your wonderful and precious name. We say amen. And she's just going to have a few words. Um, I didn't want to say much. I just wanted to thank you guys. Thank you so much for your love, for all the love that you had given my brother. Um, thank you for the brothership that he had. And uh, it was if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have met any of you. And I'm grateful to be here. And I'm just... Just thank you so much. That's all I can say. Are there any members from Charles's old church here? We just wanted to acknowledge you on behalf of our pastors. 
I heard that some may be attending. Thank you all for coming. Please know that we're still praying for you all as well. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Larry Henry to come forward, and then after that, we're going to have a special video presentation. Good afternoon. And looking at Charles' picture, I got kind of emotional. Uh, that was my man. Um, I remember the first day Charles joined the church. Uh, we had, after the church service, we had a, a little dinner upstairs for the members and all, and we hit it off immediately. I don't know, it was just something about Charles, and we just really connected and from that day forward. You know, he was a really good friend of mine. So I just want to just uh, thank Charles for being in my life. So in remembering Charles Halt, as we now, as we now, now know this one year anniversary of the passing of our brother Charles Halt, uh, we like to take the time to remember a, a good son, a brother, and a father, of course, a, a good friend. You know, it's, there's a phrase that says, uh, gone too soon. And that's pretty much an understatement when it comes to Charles. So this morning we pause and reflect on a snapshot of what our friend and brother meant to us. For many of us, Charles was on the opposite side of our laughter. His witty sense of humor and infectious smile not only filled the room, but our hearts as well. He was very intelligent and he was insightful. And Charles would make you question your question, actually. <laughs> and, everybody, and anybody who knows Charles knows that. I'm not, I'm not lying. And he was never going to back down from a spirited conversation. He would express himself through passionate verbiage and compelling arguments. He was a really a great debater. Unlike so many uh, uh, people who are in denial of their sins or of their uh, hang-ups or, or whatever their shortcomings are, Charles was an open book. And he really shared his struggles uh, with his issues that he had in his life. And he, was, he really had a good ability to speak openly about his experiences, and he, was, and he had the determination to overcome his personal battle, cause many to strive for a healthier, drug-free, Christ-centered lifestyle. His testimony will continue to enrich the lives of those we, that he crossed paths with and will be a constant reminder that we must work while it is, it is still day, and for when night comes, no man can work. So we just like to take a moment to today to remember our brother Charles and his legacy and what he left behind. And uh, me personally, he, he, when we had a conversation or if we had an argument at the end of that week, because our, 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 we stayed mad at each other for like a week, okay? <laughs> and at the end of that week, I always realized that you know, as much as I wanted to blame Charles for that argument, that it was in, it ended up being, being my fault or something that I wasn't being accommodative to Charles. And I'm going to give you an example. Uh, in our first, one of our Path to Peace meetings we had last year, we all had a, had a, a moment to speak, and Charles, uh, he had his time to speak, and everybody that knows Charles, he's long-winded. So Charles was being long-winded that day, so I jokingly, uh, mentioned that to him, and and that whole time, you know, he smiled and grinned at me the whole time after it was all said and done. But I'm gonna tell you, after that session was over, he let me have it. I'm telling you. And for a whole week, we, you know, we 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 were distanced from each other. But that moment, he made me realize when all the smoke cleared that, you know, maybe it was a time that I just I needed to back off from that and let him express himself because it was an important moment for him. So instead of me being, you know, saying, well, you know, Charles is just being sensitive, how about this? Maybe I just needed to back up off that time and just let him express himself like he wanted to because it was an important moment for him. And so that's what I got out of that, and that's the impact that Charles had over me and I'm sure over a lot of the brothers here. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Larry. Um, we have a, a short video presentation, and as we're talking about healing today, this is what our Men's Focus Sunday is about. Uh, I want you to think about 
the relationships that need repairing in your life. Could be with your children, could be with your parents, siblings, friends, whoever it is. Please don't leave here without knowing that those relationships need to be healed. And if you're waiting for the other person, if they're waiting for you, guess what? Nobody's going to move. So do what God has put on your heart to do. And um, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. I'd like to begin with just giving uh, kind of a, a background of how I grew up and how the enemy set me up at a young age, in which I didn't realize to destroy my life. Uh, at the age of 14, um, my mother found out that I was out smoking weed and stuff like that. She told my father about it. And I thought I was going to get in trouble. I didn't live with my father. My mother and father was divorced. So I went down to my father's house and he talked to me about it. And I thought I was going to get in trouble. But to my surprise, my father rolled up a joint and said that, here, smoke this. I want to see if you can handle yourself uh, under, you know, smoking weed. So, you know, being a kid that I was, I thought it was cool and I smoked that joint and, and that began our relationship as father and son, you know. At that point I was able to smoke weed in the house and drink alcohol and beer and stuff. And, and all the while I didn't know it was a setup to destroy my life, a, a setup on the end. Um, and as I got older, um, the things that my mother said I came to pass. She said, you smoke weed and it's going to elevate. And at the age of 14, I thought I'd do it all, and I was like, you know, no way would I ever do anything like that. But um, sure and behold, um, in high school, I um, started doing cocaine, and, and it just took off from there. Um, eventually, I started an experiment with crack cocaine, and that just totally um, took over my life and, and um, had a grip on me that I couldn't escape from.
do it. The devil stole a lot of that from me in my life and respect and everything. God did, did give me all that back. He did deliver me from drugs in 08, 2008, and where I walked away from drugs. But the damage was still so there. You know, uh, I hurt my daughters, and um, my daughter Dominique told me that she felt like she didn't know me. And so recently, um, And I'm going to ask Sonny, Brother Patrick, Elder Dwayne. We have a small presentation for them. So remember, healing is the focus. And as you heard, Dominique, in the video, um, it's not easy. If, if you're like me, you grew up without a father and you, you understand how that is and how it affects the home. And a father's love is so important. I'm speaking to the father specifically right now. A father's love is so important. And I don't want to beat up on you, but you have to love your children. You have to. It leaves a huge void that someone else has to come and fill. And God has given you the responsibility to be a dad. So I'm just encouraging you to love your children, love your children. The girls wanted to have some words to say. Okay. Okay, so first, thank you for honoring him. And um, one thing about my dad, he used to always tell us, put God first and do it God's way. And I used to be like, okay. But he was so extra about it. Like, sometimes he would, every time he answered the phone, he would say, praise God. And I'm just like, okay, like, that's a bit much. But hi, <laughs> like, hey, Dad, or whatever. And he used to always say, put God first. And he taught me two things. He taught me to be genuine. And while I teach downstairs, like, I try not to put myself on a pedestal and tell the youth to come up to where I am. I, like, I allow God to use me and use me where I am in my life and to just be real because he was just real. He was a real guy. And then he taught me to die to myself. And if it was up to me, I would have like controlled my life and had, it would have been a happy ending. Like, you know, you want to meet your dad and reconnect with him. And then at the end, you know, it's a, a good ending, but it wasn't that he passed away. And what he taught me was that while I'm here on this earth, it's not about me and it's not about what I want. It's, I have to die to myself and, this walk is hard, but God is with me, and it's about him. I need to put him first. And I, it restored me and God's relationship like it's the strongest it's ever been. So if anything, that's what he did for me. I'm just going to keep it short, but uh, that video was four years ago, and I'm so glad we had that opportunity to um, really reconnect. I was so angry at my dad. I think I explained that later in that video, but he humbled himself and he came and he did everything he could to restore a relationship with me. And I'm so glad that happened because I didn't know he would pass, but at least we had time to, you know, make amends. And so that's it.
Um, well, I actually got to have a moment kind of similar to that with my dad. We uh, went out to eat and I had written a blog post about it and I wrote about the five guys I had to forgive. And in that, I, I had a section that was for him. He was one of the five guys. He was the first guy that I had acknowledged. And I know it hurt him. I told him everything that was on my heart because I was always the baby. I was always oblivious to kind of what was going on. But I knew that um, as I grew older, I knew like this, you know, this wasn't right. And there's healing. There's a repair that needs to be done here. So I talked to my dad. I got to tell him that I forgave him. And that's one of the best things that I got to do because a lot of times you don't know what that person has been holding, what your parent may be holding in their life and the guilt that they hold and stuff. And I know my dad held a lot of it. And so I got to tell him, you know, I forgive you. And I I got to understand why he wasn't there. From like my point of view, I would just say he chose drugs over me and I can't. Like I would just put it to that and that would be the end of it. But he got to explain to me what his father did, what he explained in there. And then even his father, what he went through, the testimony is so powerful, but it's so it's such a strong and like it's so sad what they have been through, but it's it just shows us that it's generational for us and our family. It's generational for us to fall into drugs and alcohol and get caught up. So I wanted to just share a scripture that I just found. Sorry. That I found is Second Corinthians 7, 10, and 11. It said, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you have proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. And my father passing away brought me a lot of godly sorrow, I would say. And I've never been so aware of the things that try to come into my life and take over me. I've never been so aware of the struggles, the demons that were against me from the time that I was born. So now I know that that's in my blood, that it's been going on, but it's been with the men in my family and my dad. It's not a coincidence that he had three daughters. And so I, I have a challenge on my life now to live the best that I can and stay away from the things and the demons that are against me and to find a man that will be be on the same path and that will love God and that will not be struggling with those same things. Um, Charles is not here to give his daughters flowers, but these handsome young men spent time with Charles every Saturday running. And we just want you to know on behalf of our pastors, Elder Vince, Brother Rap and the rest of the men here at FACC that we are appreciating you and we will look out for you. Hey Amen. Thank you all so much. And for any of the young men that are looking at these ladies, you're going to have to go through us first. All right. I just want you to understand that. I couldn't help but thinking about Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's a song that the Lord gave me that I would love to share, but I cannot share this song without my rib, without my wife, without my love. So I would ask that my wife Tia, my beautiful wife, will come forward. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Is the mic on? <laughs> how many people know that it matters how you start your day? There's a difference from when you just get out the bed and then you just jump on SEPTA and you didn't pray and you didn't spend time with the word. There's a difference than when you when you actually wake up, you get in your word, you, you, you pray, and you're covered before you leave the house. Amen? So this song is called My Daily Regiment, and it's about those good days when I don't forget to pray and read my word and enter the day properly. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Praise God.
You can start it. Yo, I love Jesus, loving him to pieces Love him when he disciplines, love him when he preaches Clothes on my body, gas in my car Food in my fridge cause he never made me starve Woke up this morning, begging for forgiveness Beg him to forgive me for my sins the day before this Now it's time to praise him, praise him real loud Praise him more until he manifests his glory cloud Read in Ephesians, deep in the book Chapter 6-6 six, six says uh, I'm up A chapter a day, I sharpen my sword if I didn't do it, how could I know the Lord? Now it's time to press. Now it's time to pray. That's the only way Jehovah want me to start my day. Jesus. 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 Jesus, Jesus, yo, I start in the shower, praying to the Lord, Matthew 6, 6 says secret prayer rewards, I thank him for my family, I thank him for my friends, I thank him for my princess, I'm with her to the end, I thank him for my church, I thank him for the saints, I thank him for my pastor sent to guide me through this place, I come against lust, I come against lies, I come against anything the father despise, in the name of Jesus, I'm praying from the heart. God, I know you with me cause you with me from the start Protect all the kids, protect all the youth Make them all hunger for your holy book of truth Turn over tables like Matt 21 Make every youth bow before your holy son The war's already won I'm going through the motions I know this life is just a test of holy devotions Put your hand in favor on anything I do Let your holy spirit enter rooms before I do Protect me from my enemies, protect me from my friends Reveal all the wolves in sheep's clothing I gotta get going, no time to be late Time seems to fly when I'm seeking on your face Every must first call on Jesus Every morning I must first call on Jesus Every morning I must first call on Jesus Every morning I must first call on Jesus Praise the Lord I want to say that I miss Charles as well. What I liked about him was his honesty. And secondly, his insightfulness. So I'll miss that. I talked with him many times. How many of you love the Lord? Well, let me say that again. How many of you love the Lord? How many of you love him and you don't care who knows it? I'm going to try this. I don't know how much I'll get through it. Um, Patrick, where are you? Patrick Pika. You're going to have to help me out. <laughs> if I mess up, somebody just pick it up and take it on, take it on in. Jesus, you're the center of my joy. Oh, Sing it, brother.
Can somebody stand and sing it like you mean it? Sing Jesus. You're the heart of my contentment. I know part of it. When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my. Take it on, brother. I told you to take it. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know. You're on the spot, Pastor. Your hand, I know that part, is there to hold. Everybody know this. Good to tell, turn and tell somebody he's a center of my joy. Amen. Amen. That song captures what I'm going to be speaking about today. Uh, because we're still talking about the kingdom. And the last time I talked about entering the kingdom, there are three steps to creating kingdom culture. Let me stop for a moment before I get into my message. I just want to take the time to acknowledge Sister Melissa. Yeah. She is the mother of these three incredible young ladies, and they are incredible. And I just want to acknowledge you as well. And again, I want to acknowledge the Hard Socks here today. people. Um, three steps to creating
kingdom culture. We want kingdom culture here. And we said there are three steps to creating kingdom culture. Entering the kingdom. Centering the kingdom. And mentoring the kingdom. We talked about entering the kingdom the last time we spoke. And we said kingdom culture consists of certain things. It, it, it's made up of certain things. There's certain things that characterize kingdom culture. There's kingdom manners. There's certain way people, certain manners they have when they're in the kingdom. Thoughts, certain way they think. Certain things they value. Certain kind of behaviors. Practices. Relations. Customs. Roles. Rituals. Courtesies. Communication. Language. There's a certain way kingdom people talk. And we said that in order to enter the kingdom, the requisite, the requirement is you must be born again. Amen. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Amen. You need the new birth. And without the new birth, not only can you not enter the kingdom, you can't even see it. It'll be around you, but you won't be aware of it. So the new birth is a necessity to get into the kingdom of God. That's what we talked about the last time. But now let me go to the second step. The second step to creating a kingdom culture is centering the kingdom. What do I mean by that? Matthew 6, 33 says this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And guess what? All the things that we worry about. Uh, are anxious about. Pursue. Go after. All that. Will be added. But you first. Must seek. The kingdom. Mm. That word first. Is a Greek word which is proton. See. We need some proton saints. The people who will put the kingdom first. They will make the kingdom a priority. And center the kingdom as the center of their life. And allow everything else to revolve around it. Mm-hmm. Now, two things that we got to seek, and the word seek there suggests that you got to put some effort in finding the kingdom in the sense that there are so many distractions. One of them is money and materialism. We live in a society that is anti kingdom culture because our society pushes money and materialism but the kingdom is about the king it's all about the king and so to seek the kingdom make it a priority it means that you got to have the desire you have to work at it just to fight the distractions that will try to take your attention away from the kingdom. There are multiple distractions. And when something is the center, that's the point from which an activity process is directed or focus. When the kingdom becomes the center of your life, you want to be directed from that point. That means your attitude is, I want the king to tell me what to do. I want the king to tell me where to go. 
I want the kingdom to tell me who my husband is. Who my wife is going to be. I want the king to tell me what job I should have. Every major decision in my life starts with the kingdom and the king. Unfortunately, in this society, that's not the case. And unfortunately, this society, which is anti-kingdom, pushes prosperity. Even churches are pushing the prosperity gospel. And as a result of doing that, we have created Laodicean Christians. Seven churches in Revelation 3. The last church is supposed to represent our age. Interesting. Because of all the churches mentioned in Revelations, the harshest criticism was our age. The church of the modern era. Let me tell you what God says about the church of the modern era. He says, you make me sick. Wow. For the Lord to start off with that. He's not talking about true, Christ, true Christians. He's talking about the institutional church. He says, you make me sick. You make me want to vomit. He says in Revelations 3, I know you inside out and I find little to my liking. You're not cold. You're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. You're stale. You're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. Why, Lord? Because you brag, I'm rich. I've got it made. I need nothing from anyone. Oblivious that in fact you are pitiful, blind, you're a blind beggar, threadbare, and homeless. Wow. Modern Christians are like the church of Laodicea, they're materialistic consumers. They seek Christ for the fish and the loaves. They go after what Christ gives, but not who Christ is. Laodicean church. We've breeded Laodicean Christians because of that. What we ought to be seeking if we're going to make the kingdom and the king, the center of our life, is there two things that he says that we have to seek. Number one, we have to seek the kingdom. And number two, his righteousness. His righteousness. What does it mean to seek the king? Kingdom, excuse me. It means seek the king. It means once you find the kingdom, you will find the king. Well, guess what? The kingdom comes with the king. They're inseparable. It's not like you go after the kingdom and leave the king. Oh, no. They are inseparable. They are synonymous. Where you find the kingdom, you will find the king. And where you find the king, you will find the kingdom. The kingdom is his domain. And guess what? His domain comes with his reign. His realm comes with his rule. The prince comes with the province. It means that you acknowledge that he is in charge. He gives commands. Now suggestions. Oh, Lord, help me. Most of us want to negotiate with the Lord. 
we think that we have a choice in what he says. Not so. Mm-mm. It means that you acknowledge and accept he is Lord. He's the Lord of my life. He's the sovereign of my soul. He's the monarch of my mind. He's in charge. He gives commands. He's the authority. Therefore, people who have problems with authority are going to have problems with kingdom culture. Because in the kingdom, the king has a final say. Not you. Not your mama. Not your daddy. Not even your pastor. The king has the final say. Oh, just in case somebody forgot that, turn them to remind them. The king. The king has the final say. I always give the analogy of I was praying when I was in college for a wife. And there are a few prospects or suspects. <laughs> but when you seek the king's agenda, I appreciate what Dominique said, that when she get married, she want a man who's, that was, was that Rachel? I'm sorry, for that. She said, that's, I want a man that's righteous. Amen. Amen. The only way for you to get that kind of man is to seek the king. Because there was a young lady that I was about to get involved with. And the Spirit of God said, No! There are times when God has to shout. Can you hear me now? When I look back 40 years, I am so glad that I listened to the King. And that I accepted the kingdom agenda for my marriage. And I shudder to think what would have happened had I married that other thing. I know ministers right now who destroy their ministry. Because they didn't listen to the Lord. And the choice they made, Ray Charles could have seen that it was wrong. It pays to listen to the king. I got good news for you. He's always talking. He's just waiting for somebody to listen to him. This is not a democracy. Democracy consists of three branches, at least the American democracy. You have the executive branch, characterized by the president. You have the legislative branch, characterized by Congress. And you have the judicial branch, basically characterized by the Supreme Court. And those three powers actually are equal. That's what our present president is finding out. He 
he's finding out that he's not the king. He can't do anything that he wants to do. Because there's a judicial branch which says, no, you can't do that. In the kingdom, the executive branch, the leg legislative branch, and the judicial branch all come together in one individual. Yes. <laughs> Glory to the king! Yes. Yes. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Yes. Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, that's judicial, the Lord is our law giver, that's the legislative, and the Lord is our king, that's the executive. It is he who will save us. In the spirit realm, what has to happen, therefore, is that we all must become Esther. The Esther story is a beautiful picture of Christ and his church. The Bible says in Esther 5, 1 through 3, on the third day of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes and entered the inner court of the palace. As the bride of Christ, when we go before the king, we need to put on our royal robes and remember that we are royalty. Yes. We are kingdom children. Yes. We are somebody. Yes. If you can't do that, just put on the garment of praise. Yes. She went in to the king's presence. And what I liked about it, she said, if I perish, I'll perish. But guess what? I'm going to see the king. In other words, she came boldly. Every now and then, you got to say, look, I'm a kingdom citizen. I'm a kingdom child. I'm coming boldly to the throne of grace. I have a right to be here. She put on her royal robes and went before the king. And the Bible says the king was sitting on his royal throne. Oh, I want you to know it's a royal throne. And he was facing the entrance. In other words, he could see who would come into his presence. And when he saw Queen Esther, let me put it another way. When you come into God's presence, when he sees you coming into his presence, standing in the inner court, not the outer court, the inner court, guess what he did? He welcomed her. How did he do that? The Bible says he put out his golden scepter. Oh, hallelujah. Every time you go into the presence of God, he's got a scepter. And he puts out his scepter saying, you're my, you're my bride, you're my child, you're a citizen. You can come on in. You have a right to be here. Thank you, Lord. And how did Esther respond to the king? The Bible says she touched his scepter. Oh, what a beautiful picture of worship. Worship is when all of us touch the scepter of the king and say, yeah, you king. I don't have no problem with you being the king. You're the king. You're the sovereign. You're in charge. I bow to you. I submit to you. You run my life. Whatever you say, whatever you want, whatever you want to do, have your way. Hallelujah. Worship. Is touching the scepter of the king. Hallelujah. 
touching the scepter of the king. And once she touched that scepter, look at what he said. in my presence I'll give her what she wants hallelujah tell somebody I'm part of the bride God don't give me what I want hallelujah hallelujah That's what happens when you center the kingdom. When you make the king and the kingdom a priority. You've got to seek his rule. You've got to seek to make him in charge. You've got to say, Lord, I yield my entire life. My aspirations. My ambitions. My direction. My destiny. It's in your hands. Whatever you say. Whatever you want. Do it Lord. Have your way. I give up trying to run my life. I am found out I'm not smart enough to run it anymore. You take control. Take control. Only spiritual esters do that. I don't know about you. I'm tired of trying to run my life. Stuff up here is getting so bad. I don't know what. I need him every minute. I need him every moment. I'm to the point where I'm desperate for him, Lord. I don't want to take a breath without him. Because in him I move. I live. I have my being. Everything. There's some situations I get in. You can't help me. The lawyer can't help me. The doctor can't help me. The only hope that I have is in Christ Jesus. I've got to look to the hills from which cometh my help and recognize that my help cometh from the Lord. I'm Esther. I'm sorry, I'm Esther. I just want to touch the scepter. I just want to be in the inner court. In his presence. That's all I want now. That's what happens when you make the king and the kingdom 
the center of your life. But there's something else we got to seek. Jesus says, or the word says, seek first the kingdom. That's the king's rule. But it says something else. His righteousness. Wait a minute. Seeking his righteousness suggests there must be some other kind of righteousness. <laughs> so we need to make a distinction and we need to distinguish between his righteousness and some other kind of righteousness. Philippians 3 9. Modern King James Version says, be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God by faith. Mm. 1 Corinthians 1.30 reminds us, Christ has been made unto us righteousness. Hmm. Christ. How many of y'all got Christ? Let, 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 me, let me see that again. How many of you have Christ? The book says he has been made unto us. One of the things is righteousness. You already got righteousness. It's in you. We need to stop praying for stuff we already got. Lord, may be righteous. I'm in you. I'm on. I've been made unto you righteousness. Righteousness. Romans 5 1 reminds us that we have been justified by faith. Let me help you. That word justified in the Greek means we have been declared just or righteous. That God, through Christ, gave us the final verdict on who we are. We didn't get what we deserved. We got what Jesus preserved. God. He gave us righteousness. But there are two other forms of righteousness that we have to get rid of. Self-righteousness. And the second one is man-made righteousness. Because self-righteousness leads to self-deception. Religious pride. And holier-than-thou attitude. Let me help you out. You ain't all that. I don't care how big your Jesus is coming button is. I don't care how many bumper stickers you got on your car that says Jesus is doing. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That doesn't make you righteous. And some of us think that we're so righteous in ourselves. But the Holy Spirit has a way of Overturning the stones in your life and show you all the ants that are running around under there. We are righteous not because of how good we have been. It's only because of the grace of God. Were it not for the grace of God, there 
go I. I thank God for the testimonies because Charles was a living example of God's grace. And everybody in this room is a living, living example of God's grace. Yes, thank you, Lord. you look pretty good now, but you ain't told nobody about the stuff that you used to do, the lying you used to do, the cussing you used to do, the adultery you used to do, the fornicating you used to do. But I like the king. Because he can pick you up. The old folks say, and turn you around. I'm so glad that I am saved. I'm so glad that I know the king, the word. That I used to say, I don't see him no more. The way I used to walk, I don't walk that way no more. The way I used to talk, I don't talk that way no more. But it, not because of my own personal goodness. It's because of the Christ, the King, in me. Got to get rid of self-righteousness. Stop pointing your finger at people. When you become perfect and you get it all together, <laughs> when you have no faults, no issues, no frailties, no problems, then come talk to me. In fact, I'll join your church. But as long as you remember how you got saved, why you got saved and who saved you you'll spend the rest of your life just thanking God for his mercy and his grace because he didn't give me what I deserved get rid of self righteousness secondly get rid of man raised righteousness that means don't know don't let nobody else put their brand of righteousness on you. Amen. I was part of a few churches. They couldn't agree on how you should dress. Oh, y'all ain't going to help me. One church said, now I'm not saying you're supposed to wear everything. But at the same time, Give me a break. Man looking for the outward appearance. One church said, you got to wear your dress down here. Next church gave you a little bit of leeway. You say, oh, you can, we can wear about this length here, but you can't wear but black. I know black is beautiful, but, but <laughs> one church says you can't walk down the aisle because the Holy Ghost is in this aisle. <laughs> you, you at a church and the Holy Ghost is only in one So if I had a heart attack in that aisle, y'all would have to drag me to. I want a church where the Holy Ghost is in every aisle. The right aisle. The left aisle. The middle aisle. He's in the bathroom. He's in the closet. I want a church where the Spirit of God permeates every room. Come on, come on, come on. I'm sorry. I'm part of a church right now where God is in every room. 
somebody gets sick in the office, we stop what we're doing and we pray for them right there. If something happened in the nursery, we pray right there. Man made righteousness. Man made, can't eat certain things. Now there's certain things you shouldn't eat because of your health. But not necessarily because they're more holy than any other meal. Hallelujah. It's a holy turkey. No, honey, it's just a turkey. And you a turkey for thinking it's a holy turkey. Holy spare ribs. Now I know that's a lie. You know them spare ribs ain't holy. We religiousize everything. We make up righteousness when it's not necessary. Just accept the king. He will bring his righteousness with him. Yes. I'll be done in a minute. No, I'm not. Y'all don't, don't want me to take my time. Funny thing. Funny thing. The word righteousness in the original language is synonymous with justice. Uh huh. You see, we have a very tunnel vision, myopic view of righteousness. To us, righteousness is don't smoke, don't drink, don't don't do this, don't do that. Righteousness has a bigger scope. has a bigger scope. Righteousness is justice. Oh, y'all getting quiet on me now. That Greek word for righteousness means equity, justice, and treating folk fairly. When you treat folk unfairly, unjustly, that's unrighteous. Because righteous people act justly, and just people act righteously. They're inseparable. Check this out. I was amazed at how attuned God is about justice and righteousness. They're always together. Righteousness is equity of character, justification, integrity, virtue, rightness of thinking, acting with justice, right, righteousness and justice. The word is the same as righteousness. And justice is the same as righteousness. But check this out. I found out something. God's kingdom was established on righteousness and justice. Oh, I'm not making this up. First of all, Romans 14, 17 says, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. In other words, the kingdom of God is not consumerism, but it's, number one, righteousness. That's the first thing there. The other things there flow from righteousness or justice. Mm -hmm. Psalms 89, 14 says this, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Amen. Love and faithfulness go before you. God's whole throne is established on righteousness and justice. It's the very 
foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's established on righteousness and justice. The NIRB says your kingdom is built on what is right and fair. Your truth and faithful love lead the way in front of you. In fact, not only is God's throne established on justice, his very nature, his very nature is justice. 1 John 1, 9, New Living Translation says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just. Justice is the action. Just is the person. He's just. Isaiah 30, 18 says, For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. Isaiah 61, 8 says, Oh, here's God's own testimony. For I, the Lord, love justice. Psalms 146 Verses 5 through 7. Watch this. He gives justice to the oppressed. I ain't making this stuff up. And food to the hungry. The Lord frees the prisoner. And then Jesus gives the justice agenda in Luke 4, 18 through 20. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me. He has chosen me to tell the good news to the poor. He has sent me to tell the prisoners they are free. And to tell the blind that they can see. He sent me to free those who have been treated badly. This is the ERV translation. Those who have been treated badly, I came to free them. God's kingdom and throne are established on righteousness and justice. If that is the case, it gives new meaning to the prayer, thy kingdom come. Yes. 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 Thy will be done. Because his kingdom is established on righteousness and Injustice. Unrighteousness, and I'm closing, unrighteousness is basically injustice we do to ourselves or others. Smoking, drinking, taking drugs. That's simply the injustice you are doing to yourself. When you don't treat people right, that's injustice you are doing to others. It's all about injustice. When you say that people from seven Muslim countries cannot come to America because of terrorism and not one act of terrorism right. has come from those countries. <laughs> but the countries that have <laughs> sent us folks over here to blow us up, you somehow exclude them. You know what that is? That is unjust. Thank you for clapping. They're going to be quiet, but I don't care. I'm here to tell truth. I ain't here to soothe your ego, make you feel good. That's unjust.
two weeks ago, I believe it was two weeks ago, Elder Ferguson and Lorraine, I believe it was Lorraine, came to me and said, Pastor, there's somebody that wants to meet you. And I could tell, because I know both of them and their heart for people, I could tell that it was an evangelistic situation. They ushered me to the back of the church, and there was a man who's standing there, gray-haired. I saw pain in his eyes. There was a Muslim. He said, Pastor, I'm a Muslim, but my son is a drug addict. He didn't go to the mosque to get help. know where to go to get help and when I grabbed his hand I felt his pain it brought tears to my eyes do you think I cared that he was a Muslim I saw a soul that needed Jesus I didn't care if he worshipped Islam I didn't care about that how is he going to find Jesus if he doesn't see the love of God in me? I'm closing. I've been too long for this. How do you overcome injustice? Very simple. But doing justice. Amen. See, Martin Luther King had it right. You don't overcome racist violence with violence. That only escalates violence. It's what Jesus meant when he said, turn the other cheek, go ahead and turn it. Some of y'all say, yeah, but he didn't say that that was between the right cross or up. That is what he meant. You overcome injustice with justice. You overcome evil by doing good. We can't bury our heads in the sand and act like, oh, there's nothing we can do. You're a kingdom citizen. What do you mean there's nothing you can do? Your job is to take dominion of the earth. I'm going to give you three things I'm closing. You can do. Pray it, say it, and display it. Amen. Amen. Let me say it again. Pray it, say it, and display it. Oh, stand on your feet and turn to somebody because they might not have heard what I just said. You pray it, Get in groups of twos and threes and tell somebody what you heard today.